one year Warp Tour, Bayside was doing their acoustic performances, and my brother and I are diehard Bayside fans. And Ranieri, Ant, Ant was like playing this song. I think it was uh, Sarah Par- Partial. Oh know. yeah, that's one of his like solo songs. Yeah, one of the solo things. Yeah. yeah. So we started doing his solo stuff. I'm pretty sure because we know him. We throughout <coughs> the years we've gone to his shows and he's met us before and he loves us. And actually, I actually don't want to speak for him. <laughs> but I think he loves us. <laughs> I'm in all of these like Facebook groups for like Bayside fans or Wonder Years fans mm. or like you know fans of the bands I mentioned in this book. For someone like me, going to shows is like what helps me live. You know, Absolutely. going and like hearing those bands live, feeling it in person with all these other people mm. who are feeling it too. That's such a therapy for me. Mm. Um, and so, something I just realized yesterday is that because people, you know talk to me from that perspective of like connecting with this book because there's Bayside songs in it or mm. Jimmy Eat World songs or Dangerous Summer songs that they didn't know about or they like forgot about the Dangerous Summer and now they're listening to them again and there'll be like Facebook threads on those groups about somebody will post this book and be like, hey, have you guys seen this? And then like 30 strangers I've never met will like, and I, I'll get on there too and we'll you know, talk about it. Mm-hmm. It's just like going to a show, you know, when we can't go to that's shows cool. right now. Yeah, that's really cool. Like, it, and that's something I just like, actually when I was emailing Jimmy Eat World's management, it just hit me this morning. Yeah. But I was like, it's kind of like this. And that's why I think, I don't think it's important for me. I think it's, I mean, only for me, it's important for our community because it's giving them something that we can all get together on right now. Sure, you know? <laughs> that's fucking cool. I never actually thought about that either, dude. Yeah, like, dude. What's so cool about our community, the punk community, the emo community, is that like, there always has, because it's emo, there always has been an element of like being really vulnerable and yeah. kind of like <clears throat> wanting to talk about mental health and, and, and get to the root of it. And there's so many, throughout the years of going to Warp Tour, there's all these different, um, like, not charities, but just, like, uh, like organizations, organizations yeah. that, that deal with, like, mental health and, and getting it out there. And, like, I remember the last couple of years at Warp Tour, there was this uh, organization that would hop on the microphone before Knuckle Puck came on, and this dude would just pump up the audience, talk to your fucking friends, make sure your friends are okay, and like just like talk about mental health, and he would yeah. pump up the band while there was feedback going on, and it was just this powerful fucking thing, and dude, I get it, like it is, it is so therapy, and like I, one year at Warped Tour, Bayside was doing their acoustic performances, and my brother and I are diehard Bayside fans, like cry listening to their records, hold each other while we're watching them sing, and Ranieri, Ant, Ant was like playing this song. I think it was uh, Sarah Par- Partial. Uh, oh yeah, that's one of his like solo songs. Yeah, one of the solo things, yeah. yeah. So we started doing his solo stuff. He got on and like, I'm pretty sure, because we know him we, throughout <coughs> the years. We've gone to his shows and he's met us before and he loves us. And actually, I don't want to speak for him, <laughs> but I think he loves us. Uh, but he, I'm pretty sure, made eye contact with us while, while it was happening. And it was just this moment of just like, this community's real and, yeah. s- and super, <laughs> like such a community and I fucking love that. I eventually came to the Playwright Tavern, a Celtic pub. It looked exactly like a Celtic pub should and it had Smithix on tap. So I pulled up a bar stool and I ordered my pint. It was still only about 1.30 p.m. and I was well on my way to drunk. Thanks to a double of Johnny Walker. By 3 p.m. there was no more on my way about it. I had reached my destination. I was drunk. But, like I've said every time I've defended my alcoholism, I can do this today. I don't drink at work. I don't call out sick from work when I'm hungover, nor do I go to work drunk or hungover. In fact, I've been told by my boss on multiple occasions how impressive it is that I can be out drinking until 4 a.m. and still be at work the next day on time, looking professional and staying on task. That is, until the day I came in after our open bar Christmas party with my face smashed up like it had been dragged across a rough concrete sidewalk. A smarter, more professionally minded person might have said he had gotten mugged, but not me. I let everyone know that when I got home I dropped my keys, leaned over to pick them up, and just kept going. My face hit the rough concrete sidewalk outside of my apartment. I had a lot of tequila and Johnny Walker that night. But the next morning, I got up, cleaned my face wound a bit, and I went to work, 
which is more than I can say for some of my superiors who were just hung over and didn't even show up. I keep my responsibilities and fulfill my obligations. To me, that separates the addicts from the abusers. Yes, I abuse drugs and alcohol, but only when it's okay to do so. I'm in a luxurious hotel for the weekend, on someone else's dime. I don't have a wife or kids who need my attention. Should I sit here sober and sad that I don't have anyone who would be affected by my actions? Or should I sit here drunk and sad that I don't have anyone to share it with? <laughs> No-brainer.